The United States presidential election of 1820 was the ninth quadrennial presidential election. It was held from Wednesday, November 1st to Wednesday, December 6th, 1820. Taking place at the height of the era of good feelings, the election saw incumbent Democratic Republican President James Monroe win re-election without a major opponent. It was the third and last United States presidential election in which a presidential candidate ran effectively unopposed. It was also the last election of a president from the revolutionary generation. Monroe and Vice President Daniel D. Tompkins faced no opposition from other Democratic Republicans in their quest for a second term. The Federalist Party had fielded a presidential candidate in each election since 1796, but the party's already waning popularity had declined further following the War of 1812. Although able to field a nominee for vice president, the Federalists could not put forward a presidential candidate, leaving Monroe without organized opposition. Monroe won every state and received all but one of the electoral votes. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams received the only other electoral vote, which came from faithless elector William Plumer. Four different Federalists received electoral votes for vice president, but Tompkins won re-election by a large margin. No other post-Twelfth Amendment presidential candidate has matched Monroe's share of the electoral vote, and Monroe and George Washington remain the only presidential candidates to run without any major opposition. Monroe's victory was the last of six straight victories by Virginians in presidential elections. <inaudible> <inaudible> Background Despite the continuation of single-party politics known in this case as the era of good feelings, serious issues emerged during the election in 1820. The nation had endured a widespread depression following the Panic of 1819 and momentous disagreement about the extension of slavery into the territories was taking center stage. Nevertheless, James Monroe faced no opposition party or candidate in his re-election bid, although he did not receive quite all of the electoral votes see below. Massachusetts was entitled to 22 electoral votes four years earlier, but cast only 15 in 1820. The decrease was brought about by the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which made the region of Maine—long part of Massachusetts—a free state to balance the pending admission of slave state Missouri. Pennsylvania, Tennessee and Mississippi each cast one fewer electoral vote than they were entitled to, on account of one elector from each state dying before the electoral meeting. This explains the anomaly of Mississippi casting only two votes, when any state is always entitled to a minimum of three. Mississippi, Illinois, Alabama and Missouri participated in their first presidential election in 1820, Missouri with controversy, since it was not yet officially a state see below. No new states would participate in American presidential elections until 1836, after the admission to the Union of Arkansas in 1836 and Michigan in 1837 after the main voting, but before the counting of the electoral vote in Congress. Nominations Democratic-Republican Party nomination Since President Monroe's renomination was never in doubt, few Republicans bothered to attend the nominating caucus in April 1820. Only 40 delegates attended, with few or no delegates from the large states of Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. Rather than name the president with only a handful of votes, the caucus declined to make a formal nomination. Richard M. Johnson offered the following resolution. It is inexpedient, at this time, to proceed to the nomination of persons for the offices of President and Vice President of the United States. After debate, the resolution was unanimously adopted, and the meeting adjourned. President Monroe and Vice President Daniel D. Tompkins thus became de facto candidates for re-election. <laughs> General election Campaign <laughs> 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 Effectively there was no campaign, since there was no serious opposition to Monroe and Tompkins. Disputes 
On March 9, 1820, Congress had passed a law directing Missouri to hold a convention to form a constitution and a state government. This law stated that, "...the said state, when formed, shall be admitted into the Union, upon an equal footing with the original states, in all respects whatsoever." However, when Congress reconvened in November 1820, the admission of Missouri became an issue of contention. Proponents claimed that Missouri had fulfilled the conditions of the law and therefore was a state. Detractors contended that certain provisions of the Missouri Constitution violated the United States Constitution. By the time Congress was due to meet to count the electoral votes from the election, this dispute had lasted over two months. The counting raised a ticklish problem. If Congress counted Missouri's votes, that would count as recognition that Missouri was a state. On the other hand, if Congress failed to count Missouri's vote, it would count as recognition that Missouri was not a state. Knowing ahead of time that Monroe had won in a landslide and that Missouri's vote would therefore make no difference in the final result, the Senate passed a resolution on February 13, 1821 stating that if a protest were made, there would be no consideration of the matter unless the vote of Missouri would change who would become president. Instead, the president of the Senate would announce the final tally twice, once with Missouri included and once with it excluded. The next day this resolution was introduced in the full House. After a lively debate, it was passed. Nonetheless, during the counting of the electoral votes on February 14, 1821, an objection was raised to the votes from Missouri by Representative Arthur Livermore of New Hampshire. He argued that since Missouri had not yet officially become a state, it had no right to cast any electoral votes. Immediately, Representative John Floyd of Virginia argued that Missouri's votes must be counted. Chaos ensued, and order was restored only with the counting of the vote as per the resolution and then adjournment for the day. Results Popular vote The Federalists received a small amount of the popular vote despite having no electoral candidates. Even in Massachusetts, where the Federalist slate of electors was victorious, the electors cast all of their votes for Monroe. This was the first election in which the Democratic Republicans won in Connecticut and Delaware. Source Electoral vote. Electoral College Box scores 1789-1996. National Archives and Records Administration. Retrieved July 30, 2005. Source: Popular Vote. A New Nation Votes. American Election Returns 1787 to 1825. A. Only 15 of the 24 states chose electors by popular vote. B. Adams received his vote from a faithless elector. C. There was a dispute as to whether Missouri's electoral votes were valid due to the timing of its assumption of statehood. The first figure excludes Missouri's votes, and the second figure includes them. Topic. Electoral vote The sole electoral vote against Monroe came from William Plumer, an elector from New Hampshire and former United States Senator and New Hampshire Governor. Plumer cast his electoral ballot for Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. While legend has it this was to ensure that George Washington would remain the only American president unanimously chosen by the Electoral College, that was not Plumer's goal. In fact, Plumer simply thought that Monroe was a mediocre president and that Adams would be a better one. Plumer also refused to vote for Tompkins for vice president as grossly intemperate, not having that weight of character which his office requires, and because he grossly neglected his duty in his only official role as president of the Senate by being absent nearly three fourths of the time. Plumer instead voted for Richard Rush. Even though every member of the Electoral College was pledged to Monroe, there were still a number of Federalist electors who voted for a Federalist vice president rather than Monroe's running mate Daniel D. Tompkins. The votes for Richard Stockton came from Massachusetts. The entire Delaware delegation voted for Daniel Rodney for vice president. Finally, Robert Goodlow Harper's vice presidential vote was cast by an elector from his home state of Maryland. These breaks in ranks were not enough to deny Tompkins a substantial electoral victory. Monroe's share of the share of the electoral vote has not been exceeded by any more recent candidate, with the closest competition coming from Franklin D. Roosevelt's 1936 re-election campaign. 
Only Washington, who won the vote of each presidential elector in the 1789 and 1792 presidential elections, can claim to have swept the Electoral College. Washington's campaigns took place prior to the 1804 ratification of the Twelfth Amendment, which instituted the current system in which each member of the Electoral College casts one vote for president and one vote for vice president. Under the original system, each elector cast two votes, with no distinction made between the electoral votes for president and the electoral votes for vice president. Thus, in both of his campaigns, Washington won the maximum number of electoral votes any individual could receive, but only half of the electoral votes that were cast. Source. Electoral College Box Scores 1789-1996. National Archives and Records Administration. Retrieved July 30, 2005. A, there was a dispute over the validity of Missouri's electoral votes, due to the timing of its assumption of statehood. The first figure excludes Missouri's votes and the second figure includes them. Topic: <inaudible> Breakdown by ticket. A, there was a dispute over the validity of Missouri's electoral votes due to the timing of its assumption of statehood. The first figure excludes Missouri's votes and the second figure includes them. Note that all of these tickets except Monroe, Tompkins are split tickets, with a Democratic-Republican presidential candidate and a Federalist vice presidential candidate. Note also that these split tickets represent only 5.6% of the electoral vote. Electoral college selection See also Era of Good Feelings History of the United States 1789 Single Party Second Inauguration of James Monroe United States House of Representatives Elections, 1820 United States Senate Elections, 1820